Now, there's no question for us that as we experience life, as we walk through life, we know we go through times of sorrow and pain and difficulty. I just heard a testimony uh, of a young couple who walked through a period, a time uh, of, of pain in life. We understand as believers, but it's the general experience of humanity that by and large, our days on earth are marked by trials and trouble. We've explored several of the psalms of lament. These psalms that are expressions of the pain that God's people experience in life and how they're seeking relief. How they're crying out to God for God's deliverance, for God's rescue, for God's plan to, to bring them through those times into the times of rejoicing that should be the desire of every follower of Jesus Christ. In the psalm that we're going to look at today, this 39th psalm, a psalm attributed to David, um, it's a psalm of lament, but it's an, it's an especially uncomfortable psalm of lament, as we'll see when we walk through it. The psalmist here is venting against God himself. And at times those things seem to kind of trouble our spirits a little bit. He's questioning God. At least that's what it appears to be in the psalm. Now, if you've been a follower of Christ for any length of time, you've walked with God for any length of time, you've walked through seasons of trouble. We're all going to find them. Distress, pain, suffering, affliction. And what you're going to have in common with David, as you'll see through this particular psalm, is that as you're going through these things, you're going to have questions. You're going to experience maybe even real anger towards God and frustration and confusion and struggling with God. You may find yourself in those particular troubling moments right now where there seems to be more questions and objections than there are answers. And maybe you've experienced that in the past. But as we walk through the, the movement of this particular psalm, I believe that we're going to be challenged we're going to be challenged by David's uh, actions. We're going to be challenged by his particular reflections and his experiences in his own dark night of the soul as he pours out his anguished heart to God. We might find ourselves unsettled by this unresolved note that this psalm ends with as David acknowledges that God is his only hope and he's pleading with God for deliverance from his own sin and for God to give him relief. But my prayer, as always, especially as we walk through these particular psalms, is that we would be encouraged by the hope we have in the promise of our own future deliverance in Christ Jesus. So let's turn to God's word, Psalm 39. Hear the words of the living God. I said, I will guard my ways, that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail, and my distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me. As I mused, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. O oh Lord, make me know my end, and what is the measure of my days? Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. And now, O oh Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. I am mute. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Remove your stroke from me. I am spent by the hostility of your hand. When you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Surely all mankind is a mere breath. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears, for I am a sojourner with you, 
a guest like all my fathers. Look away from me, that I may smile again before I depart, and I am no more. These are the words of the Lord. Now this morning, we're going to consider this, fall, this particular psalm uh, in four parts. First, David's reticence, then David's reflection, his repentance, and lastly, his requests. Notice here uh, in God's Word the title of this psalm. What is the measure of my days? And the superscription to the choir master, to Jeduthun, a psalm of David. So we know it's a psalm attributed to David, and likely it was written by David at some juncture in his particular life. Uh, but it's uh, attributed to Jeduthun. Now, Jeduthun uh, in Chronicles is listed as one of the three men that David appointed to lead worship before the Ark of the Lord uh, in the tent that David constructed that he pitched uh, for the Ark um, at the uh, land that belonged to Obed-Edom. And this particular worship leader, his role was to lead music with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments you can read about this in 1 Chronicles 16 and also in chapter 25, where it tells us that Jeduthun prophesied with the lyre in thanksgiving and praise to the Lord. So it seems that this particular composition was placed in these, the capable and skilled hands of Jeduthun to set David's lyrics to music. And why this is important as I consider this particular psalm is that this is an individual psalm of lament. This is something personal to David, but, but it's being set to music because it's being given to the people of God. And it's going to be instructive for the people of God. So I want us to read it, that we're going to learn something from it. We're, we're, we're being taught something by David's particular lament here that is important for the life of God's people. Notice how this particular psalm starts. Because it's striking that David is determined to keep his mouth shut. Now, we're used to David opening his mouth and expressing things, but here he's saying he's made a determination to keep silent, right? He is reticent to voice his complaint, to vent his frustration and anguish, especially in public. David says like this, he starts this way, I said, he wants us to know exactly what he said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. David knew that if he voiced publicly what he was really feeling, the, the, the inner workings and emotions of his heart, the questions he had, the anger and anguish he felt, that he would inevitably sin with his mouth. So he says, I placed a muzzle on my mouth, like a muzzle is placed on, on an animal. Maybe it's placed on a dog to keep him from barking uh, and, and biting. He says he, he did that to himself to keep silent in his suffering. And he says, so long as the wicked were in his presence. David is facing an internal struggle. And whatever it is he's walking through, this psalm doesn't actually tell us where he was in life, what he was going through, what distress uniquely he was in at this moment. But he has to restrain himself from speaking about his troubles before the wicked especially, because if he does, he'll likely sin against God. It's obvious, and even though we don't know particularly what his distress was, it's obvious that he's in distress of some kind. And it's obvious to the people that are around David. And it's especially obvious, he says, to the wicked. Why particularly, we don't know. Maybe they were bringing false charges against David. Maybe they were observing that David was in some trouble, in some sorrow, in some affliction, and they're mocking him. They're gloating about the misery David was in. Now, we've seen this before when we looked at Psalm 22, that David was in distress and, and he was in trouble. And he writes this in Psalm 22, 7 and 8. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. They were mocking David. Oh, here's this, this great champion for God. He's always praising God and talking about how God awesome is. 
Well, where is his God now? Why isn't his God delivering him? So maybe he knew that his enemies would love nothing more than to exploit his vulnerability and mock his trust in God. Whatever it was, he suppresses his speech. He even suppresses saying positive things about God. Praising God and what he's going through, worried that if he opens his mouth, he couldn't restrain himself from sinfully venting all that is in his heart. And it's interesting that this is the course of action David chooses to take. To avoid further sin, he's just going to keep his mouth shut in his trouble. Well, one of the problems with that is his restraint in even saying good things about God. Because like every creature, David owes it to God to speak well of his name, no matter what he's going through. And David couldn't even do that in that moment. And I know many of us can identify with that. Maybe his questions and condition would cause him to speak harshly about God, so he chooses not to say anything at all. And if he said something before the wicked, that would give them further cause in their opposition to God and to persist in their sinfulness. So he says, I'm just going to remain silent lest I sin. How often, when we find ourselves in the thick of trouble, and like David, in times of distress and suffering, when we have serious questions, right, that, that arise, serious uh, objections, maybe real anger and frustration towards God and directed against God, that, that we have failed to keep silent and we've opened our mouth and actually have said something sinful. See, David commits to not work out his frustrations with God's dealings and his struggles with the way God is disciplining him in public. Even in what he's feeling on the inside, and it seems like it's deep and it's dark, he doesn't want to tarnish the name of God before an unbelieving world. He doesn't want unbelievers to have cause to revile the name of God. He doesn't want to air out his dirty laundry before the eyes of the unbelieving world, especially with those who don't share his beliefs, who don't share his faith in God, and his opening his mouth would actually encourage their opposition to God. I know that doesn't happen anymore in the world today. But it's funny, it's every single day, right? I open my social media, and every day I see a post from a supposed Christian that demonstrates that they have not set a guard over their mouth. That they have not kept silent when maybe they should have kept silent. We know it's fashionable for people who claim to have faith in God to just express all of their questions and doubts and frustrations before anyone and everyone who will listen to them. Like that just becomes the way to vomit out everything that's in our hearts so that everyone can read and agree or disagree and whatnot. And when we know it's cool, right, to deconstruct our faith publicly. Here's all the questions I have about God. And here's all of the things that just have caused me to waver in my faith. Now, I want you to understand something. I'm not saying having questions is a bad thing. We will all struggle and have questions. We all struggle with, with things we're wrestling with and doubt. That's not the issue here. But when, when people just kind of vomit all these things out before an unbelieving world, in the struggles that they're having and, and the difficulty that they're going through, it gives people who already hate God, who already don't share your faith, right, an opportunity for them to say, ah, see, Look at that. You, you have faith in God, and look at your life right now. It's a mess. Look what you're going through. Like, where is your God now? It's exactly what they did to David. It's exactly what David walked through and why he learned, hey, you know what, I just, I, I just, it's best to keep my mouth shut. Again, struggling with your faith in times of trouble and having questions is not the issue. Because we all have those. It's how you handle those times. It's how you deal with those things. How you address them. We'll have those times in our walk of faith, but there's a fundamental difference in working through those issues with God and working through those issues with God's people and working them out in a way that is public before an unbelieving world that actually brings disgrace to the name of God. 
And that's what David is working out right here. He's dealing with painful trials, he, deep issues of his soul, privately wrestling and struggling with God. That's what's happening. He's in the throes of that. You might be in those moments right now. You may have lots of questions and very few answers. You might even be angry with God over something that you've gone through or are going through. But you have to be careful to watch against the sins that creep up potentially in our life at, at these particular moments and junctures uh, of, of affliction and suffering and sorrow. <coughs> sins like murmuring and complaining and venting our distance content before people who will take what we say to further rebel against God and revile God. And that, that would be sinful. Now, David's silence, as we look at this, over time only heightens his anxiety. In verse 2, look what he writes. I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail, and my distress grew worse. <laughs> grew worse. His plan wasn't working. Right? The more he meditated upon his situation, the more he sat and stewed and thought about it, the longer he kept silent, he became like a pressure cooker. Right? It was all building up inside, and that lid was about to blow off. So he writes, as I mused, my heart became hot with me as I mused, the fire burned. Burned. His inward thoughts were fermenting and the fire was burning hot so that he could contain it no longer. It's growing more and more agitated like a, like a volcano ready to erupt with fiery lava. But I want you to see David was actually exercising prudence in restraining his tongue before unbelievers. He was being careful to not sin with his mouth by keeping silent. That's wisdom. That's what James chapter 3 reminds us, right? The tongue is a world of evil, right? It's a fire set up by the very flames of hell, right? We sin so easily with our tongue, right? Because out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. And in the moments when we're in the middle of something very hard and our emotions are overwhelming us, we're going through it really in a, in a really tough place. It's very easy to sin with our mouth. So it was prudent for him to keep silent. But the way he was handling his grief was intensifying his inner anguish of soul. Being silent and not even saying positive things and directing his grief to God was eating him up. So there's wisdom in being silent before unbelievers and not venting all of our uh, questions and anger before a world that doesn't care about God and is just going to be quick to tear you apart and tear you down, that's where we need to pause before we post things and let people know everything that's going wrong with our life. And you've read it. You've seen it. Someone posts something, and their intent is, hey, would you, uh, I'm going through this. Would you pray for me? And then the pile-on starts. You ever see that? You ever experienced that? It happens all the time. Like every day I see that take place. So wisdom says, zip it. There, there's a right place to vent. There's a right place to pour out your heart. And that's what David does here. Pours himself out to God. Now there's also wisdom in us pouring ourselves out before a wise and mature and godly brother or sister in the Lord. That's helpful, especially when they can not only just listen, but pray for you and encourage you and counsel you. But here David breaks the muzzle on his tongue and he speaks. We see that right there in verse 4. O Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days? Let me know how fleeting I am. He asks a question because he's reflecting on his life. He's meditating upon the purpose of his suffering, his sorrow and darkness that he's walking through. So what's he asking? He's asking God to tell him how many days does he have left on this earth that he has to endure what he is going through. How many days, O Lord? Make me to know my end. What is the measure of my days? He wants to know if there is an end to his sorrows. He wants to know, Lord, how much longer do I have to endure this before I go down to the grave 
He wants assurance from God that his life will be over soon and his trials with him. That's how heavy whatever he was going through was weighing upon his heart. That's how anxious and dark his heart had become as he meditated and, and, and stewed upon what he was walking through. Now, we might not express our questions this way, but we also would like to know, right, especially when we're going through something exceedingly difficult, how long, God? How long do I have to endure this? How long does this have to go on for? But I also see another side to this because of what we know about David, because what we know of how David has handled similar situations like this in life. He is a man of faith. Even though he's got questions, even though he's frustrated, maybe even angry towards God, there's, there's some of that in this, and the, and, and, and the language in, in the Hebrew is actually a little more intense than some of our English translations don't seem to capture it, it as deeply here. But he's a man of faith. And he's also expressing this to, and is reflecting on this to contemplate the, the brevity of life. So that he knows how he can better bear up under the momentary experiences of pain and suffering that he has to walk through. And that's why this individual psalm of lament also has a, a wisdom element to it here. Because he's addressing the question of meaning and purpose. What's the meaning of life? What is the purpose of all of this? What is the purpose of suffering and pain and trouble? He's asking it in the same way here. And isn't that what happens to us when we're going through something? To reflect on the brevity of life, how fleeting it is, how transient. Like we're here today and we're gone tomorrow. Especially when we consider the span of our life with the span of human history and against eternity. Our life is short. It is a blip. David acknowledges here, Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. A few hand breaths. A, a hand breath was the smallest of uh, ancient measurements. This man basically of four fingers. He's like that. One hand breath. That's the span of my lifetime compared with eternity. With who you are. My lifetime is nothing before you. Before the eternal, what is frail human life is but one tick of the second hand of a clock. Not long ago, I was uh, reading an interview by the musician John Mayer, and uh, he was asked the question because he has an album cover uh, that depicts a, um, a grandfather clock that's set to a specific time. And the interviewer was asking him, does that have any particular significance to you that you actually put 10.38 a.m. As, as the time that it displays? And, and, and Mayer expressed that he's obsessed with time. He's obsessed with contemplating his, his place in the universe and his, his place in the span of human history and time. He's obsessed with it. And, and what he said to the interviewer was the way he looks at his life is to consider the average life expectancy of a human as that of a 24-hour day. And if you think about it, if all of human life is 24 hours, like what time of day are you in? That's the question he's seeking to ask. And for his time when, he, when that album came out, he was about, I don't know, maybe 30 years old. So he was kind of in the lunchtime of his life, basically, is what he expressed. But it's an interesting way to contemplate how brief our life is, how short our lifetime is, to see your life as an entire day. What time of day are you in in life? Some are in breakfast if you're young, some lunchtime, some early afternoon, for some they're rapidly approaching dinner and sunset, and for some midnight is at hand. Wisdom dictates that because God has fixed the span of our life in such a way that we should reflect on the brevity of life. We should be careful to attend to it with much grace, even as we can expect it to be filled with toil. 
in trouble. Moses expresses it like this in Psalm 90. We're going to look at verse 9, uh, 10, and 12. All, for all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are gone soon, and we fly away. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Lord, teach us to number our days. <coughs> David and Moses, both reflecting on life's brevity and the trouble and pain that marks our brief life. So reflect on that. Life is short. Life is short. It's brief. <coughs> Moses says, Lord, teach me to get a heart of wisdom. To knowing that there's going to be toil, knowing that there's going to be heartache, knowing that there's going to be suffering, knowing that each day probably will be punctuated by some kind of trial that will bring tears. Teach me to, to live this life with a heart of wisdom. It's brief and make the most of it. Living it in such a way that glorifies you and honors you. And it's about serving you and pleasing you and not disgracing your name by how I handle what I go through in life. David wrote, Surely all my mankind stands as a mere breath. He repeats this phrase twice here. In verse 11 he says again, Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Man at his best is but breath. Here today, not tomorrow. What he writes in these couple of verses here reminds me so much of the preacher in Ecclesiastes. Like this is what he was wrestling with, thinking about life thinking about everything he sees under the sun, seeing the toil and trouble, and he opens up, right? Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. All of it. That word vanity is the same word as breath that we see there in Psalm 39. Pebble means vapor. Some of your translations say it all is meaningless. But the idea is that life is like the puff of a smoke. You're smoking a good cigar and you blow out a nice puff of smoke, right? Try to grab that smoke. You can't. It slips right through your fingers. It's elusive. It's ethereal. Life is like that. David acknowledges that. Moses acknowledges that. The preacher of Ecclesiastes tells us that life is transitory. It's like smoke, like a mere breath. James chapter 4 to guard against the presumptuousness of, of saying you're going to state you're going to do one thing tomorrow or another the apostle writes what is your life for you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes that's life especially against eternity especially considering the whole span of human history I know it's everything for us right here but it's gone. It's fleeting. It's momentary. David shares about the vain and empty pursuits of life, which are but a shadow. That's what he writes there. Verse 6, surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. But he's saying life is so short, but what, what do people spend their time in? They fret and worry about the things that are inconsequential. They become anxious over things that he says are really nothing. Oh, and you know what's vain? It, it's, it's, it's spending your life in the pursuit of, of wealth and riches and amassing treasures and possessions and all of this only to, while you're pursuing those things, death is pursuing you because that's the end of every person. Whether they know God or they don't know God, whether they're in Christ or they don't know Christ, that is the end of all of us. We will die. And he said, the, the vain thing is that when they die, those who pursue those things, they don't even know where their treasures are going to end up. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, one toils for all these things in life only for a stranger to possess those things when you're dead. David's reflection in the face of suffering and trials is insightful for us. He asks the same questions all of us ask in these times. Even righteous Job 
when afflicted by trouble, was at a deep place of questioning and seeming hopelessness. He struggled to find purpose in his pain. You read Job, man. The large majority of it is Job just venting and complaining. He'd become bitter in his soul, expressing how fleeting his life was, how painful the arrows of the Lord were. I don't even know how many times he utters the phrase, I loathe my life. Put that on a t-shirt. It's a nice social media meme right there. That's, think about what he's saying. I loathe my life because of what he was walking through, what he was going through, when he's reflecting and meditating upon just the suffering he was enduring. He's like, this is meaningless. I want it to be over. He was praying for God to end it. They all express the same thing that many of us do in painful and dark times in life where there are more questions than answers when we're angry and confused. When, oh God, will I get some relief? And if my days are so few, why do you fill our days with so much sorrow? I know there's no answers for you there, but you might find yourself in at least good company to know that David and Moses and Job and many of the saints of God experience what all of us experience today. And it might be refreshing for you to hear that you're not alone. But I believe David's reflection and contemplation on the brevity of life actually brought him comfort. Knowing that the sorrow and pain and trouble and all the vain things of life will soon come to an end. He didn't know when, but they would. And finally, we see in verses 7 through 11 here, we learn why the psalmist kept silent. Why he didn't want to share his questions and struggles in the presence of the wicked. See, his reflection on the brevity of life is motivated by the reality that he is dealing with sorrow and pain because of God's discipline in response to his sin. That's why he didn't want to make that known so readily. But it's coming in David's life. It's coming by the hand of God. Now we saw that last week in verse uh, in Psalm 32, verse 4, where David expresses that the hand of the Lord is heavy upon him. David acknowledges, man, what I'm walking through right now, as hard as it is, that's, that's coming by God's discipline. Many times the pain, trouble, and sorrow we experience in life is caused at the hands of others. People hurt us. People sin against us. People do things to us. And that brings us pain and suffering and sorrow. Many times it's our own foolishness, right, that we engage in, in life and things happen to us and that causes pain and sorrow. And sometimes it's because the world is broken our bodies are broken, that we succumb to some kind of affliction. But there are times where the sorrow and pain that we experience in life is part of God's discipline in our life. It comes from the hand of the Lord. And we'll see that in various psalms. And in verse 7, David turns to God. He turns to God and he expresses, my hope is in you. Now, O Lord, for what do I wait? What do I look for? What what hope do I have? My hope. My hope is in you. And he asked for God to lift his hand and give him relief from the painful discipline he is enduring. You are my only hope to be delivered from my transgressions. It's an act of repentance. Not explicitly written out, but it's what's taking place. Requesting for God to deliver him, acknowledging that his pain and suffering must be the correcting discipline from the Lord for his sin. And since the painful dealings that he's walking through and going through were God's doing, he realizes that he must indeed remain silent. And there you see that in verse 8. Uh, um, he, said, he says, deliver me from my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. In verse 9, I am mute. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. It's you who've done it. Spurgeon's commentary on this um, particular psalm and on this verse in his Treasury of David, he writes, here we have a nobler silence, sweetened by submission. 
Nature failed to muzzle the mouth, but grace achieved the work in the worthiest manner. He recognizes, God, I know I'm going through this. I know what the cause of the sorrow is. It's by my own doing and my sin and the discipline that's coming to me is of you. And it's painful. It's a submission. And I find it, David's expression here is submission to the divine will. He knows it's coming from God. He knows God has a purpose in it. He knows God is disciplining him. Job himself discovered this. That what had come upon him was from the hand of the Lord. And you'll see that at the end there in Job 42. It's coming to him for a divine purpose. And he repented. David pleads there in verse 10. Remove your strokes from me. What are those strokes? That's the disciplining rod of the Lord. Each one a stroke. It's painful, isn't it? It's meant to be painful. It's meant to be felt. And it is. David feels it. And while we don't readily understand the purpose of trials, especially in the moment of, of our tears, of our turmoil, of our trouble, and every other suffering under the sun, we can be assured if those things are coming to us from God's discipline by His hand, there is glorious divine purpose behind it. There has to be. God's discipline is not meant to consume us like a moth consumes a piece of fabric. Though David felt like that's what he was experiencing. God's discipline is meant to consume our sin. And make us more like Christ. God's discipline, the writer of Hebrews reminds us, is coming from the hand of a loving father. I want us to read this lengthier portion there in Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, chapter 12 rather. And we've looked at this before. But I, I want us to see this in God's word. Because some of us need to be reminded of us when we're in the thick of God's discipline and the heavy hand of God that there is purpose in it. It's not meaningless. It's not in vain. The writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, <clears throat> we're going to start in verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. What is God doing in his loving discipline? Well, we're reminded there. He's doing this because he loves us as a son. We're his children. And because we're his children, he's going to discipline us. What is God doing in discipline? Well, he's disciplining us for our good. Not for our harm. Not for our destruction. Not for our punishment, not to tear us down, not to crush us to the ground, not to feel like we're less than dirt, not to feel like life is meaningless and purposeless. For our good. He's disciplining us so that we may share his holiness. And even if it's painful and in the moment unpleasant, and we have more questions than we have answers, and even if you might get upset with God and feel some anger and frustration... Know that God's discipline is not meant to punish you, but to produce in you the peaceful fruit of righteousness. God had a purpose in David's discipline. And he was feeling it hard. He was feeling it so hard that he was fearful of even opening up his mouth because he might actually say something he was going to regret. He might say something harsh against God in the presence of wicked people who would love nothing more than to tear him down even more. 
even painful, unpleasant discipline is meant to do something in us. Not to punish, but to produce Christ-likeness in us. To further shape us and conform us to Christ, to sanctify us. And maybe you're experiencing God's discipline in your life right now. Maybe you don't know the ultimate source of everything that's going on in your life and what caused it. You might. But it might also be true that because of sin in your life, because you know, you've rebelled against God in a certain way, that God in His loving discipline is bringing correction to your life. And it's painful. But it's meant to be. It's not meant to drive you away from God. It's not meant to cause you to run from God, but to run to God. And to vent before God and, and, and to pour out your heart before God and recognize that what's unpleasant in the moment <coughs> has a purpose to produce in us the peaceful fruit of righteousness. It's for our good. David makes a final request of the Lord in those last two verses. Crying out for mercy, crying out that God would bring this season of discipline and correction and tears to a speedy end. He says so he can smile can you see that? Isn't that what you want when you're going through sorrow? To be able to smile again. To be able to rejoice. And that's what David wants. And if God doesn't withdraw his discipline, he fears he will not be around for much longer. But David appeals to God on the basis of the hope he has in him. Look at verse 12 there. He says, For I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. Now, this is Old Testament language and imagery rooted in Leviticus and what the people of God were. Uh, but he sees himself there in the stream of all the covenant people of God. I'm a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. He recognizes he lives before God as an alien and a stranger in this world like all of the people of God before him, like his father's. David knew who he was, and David knew where he was going. He is in the line of the covenant people of God, and like all of the people of God, they were pilgrims passing through this world. He hadn't lost faith, even as he was going through his own faith struggle. He hadn't given up on God, even though enduring God's discipline had him at times feeling like God had given up on him. David's hope was in the promise of what is to come to those whose hope is in God. In the 11th chapter of Hebrews, we have a beautiful chapter there chronicling many of the Old Testament saints whose faith and hope was in the promises of God. And the writer there tells us that Abraham believed God, that he obeyed God. He left his homeland to go live in the land of promise. But throughout the entirety of his life, he lived in tents moving around like a foreigner in a foreign land. And in Hebrews 11.10, it tells us that Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Even though God told him to get himself up out of the land of his fathers and go to the land of promise, he knew this wasn't it. This is temporary. This, this life, I'm a sojourner through all of this. I'm on a path, I'm on a journey, and what I'm looking forward is to the city that God has promised me. In verse 13 and 16 of that same chapter, speaking of all of those saints of God in the Old Testament, all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Think about that. All of these Old Testament saints of God, by faith, believed in what God was promising them. And though in the natural, with their own eyes, they, they 
never saw it. They never entered into that promise themselves, but they did see it. They, they saw it in faith, and their hope wasn't in this thing here on earth, or if it were, they, they'd have gone back to the land, their homeland, right? Because many of them, as you know their stories, right, walked through great affliction and suffering and sorrow. But their eyes were on the better country that was promised. The city whose builder and maker is God. That heavenly city. The, the city that God had prepared for them. That's the hope of everyone who's placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And the promises that God has made in him. This life is brief. This life is short. This life is fleeting. It is a blip. And it will be filled with trouble. But we know that this life isn't everything. So why would we live our life as if it were? Why would we live this life, these short days on earth, and try to squeeze every ounce of pleasure and fulfill every craving we have until we just die? Until we go to the grave? No, no, as people of God, we understand that, that in this life we'll have trouble, and in, in this life we're going to be disciplined by our loving Heavenly Father, because he's preparing us for glory. He's preparing us for the better country. The city whose maker and builder is God. He's preparing us for the new heavens and for the new earth. We know the promise there, don't we? A place where there will be no more sorrow, no more darkness, no more sickness, no more worry, no more pain. And if you're in Christ, that's where you're headed. If you're in Christ, you know that's what I am here. I'm on a journey. I'm on a path. I know who I am. I know who I am in Christ Jesus. I know where I'm going. The reason we can have that hope is because when we walk through dark seasons and painful trials and endure discipline at the hand of God, we know He's not punishing us because Christ has been punished for us. He's been punished for our sins. And God's discipline doesn't mean he doesn't love us. Doesn't mean that God delights in seeing us suffer. Because God's word tells us that in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 tells us that God, rich in mercy, rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with God in Christ. By grace we've been saved. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us, Christ Jesus. Everything that we walk through in life, everything you are walking through in this brief life, God has purpose to prepare you for what he has promised. What is painful now will have ultimate relief then. What fills your life with tears now, we know. Every tear will be wiped away. What is sickness to you now will find true and lasting healing on that day when we are face to face with him, with the one who loved us and gave himself for us. All that we will have experienced, every sorrow, every tear, every heartache, it'll make perfect sense. All of it, all of it. Death will be swallowed up in victory. You and I will experience eternal, unspeakable joy. Here's what that means for you and me. It means we can come to God with every question, every complaint, every fear we have, every anxiety, every worry, even voicing to him our frustration and anger because we know who we are. We are reconciled to God in Christ. You are a loved child of God in Him. That's why the, the writer of Hebrews reminds us, hey, you know, like what you do with your earthly fathers, how you can go to them and they'll discipline you. And, and they try to do it as they seem as best, but everything God does in disciplining us, everything He does in our life is for our good. To produce in us everything needful to prepare us for glory for that day. It means that we know where we're going. We're going to the heavenly city, passing through this brief life and looking forward to the day when Christ will make all things new. All to the praise and glory of God.
of his.